Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us to the Learn Security and My Security Media. My name is Chris Cubbage. I'll moderate uh, today's session uh, with Niall Whelan, who is the uh, Principal Field Data Scientist for Asia Pacific with ICADA, looking at fraud prevention with a focus on customer experience. Niall, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Chris. Really happy to be here. Very good. And uh, no pressure on us to make sure that we do have a good customer experience. So we'll make sure uh, that we have that covered in the background. Uh, for the audience, uh, the protocols are, this session is being recorded. It will be available on demand on the Learn Security platform, I promise, uh, uh, soon after this. Uh, and then also we do encourage Q&A. So if you find throughout this session that uh, you want to have uh, some particular area covered or you have a question, don't hesitate to ask uh, and I'll moderate that as, as Niall walks through. Uh, and again, on Learn Security and on a follow-up email, there will be uh, some handouts on this as well. There is a white paper that goes with this particular session. And this also follows off on a My Security TV session we did with Niall and uh, Dan Zhou uh, in Singapore on fraud prevention with ACADA. And that's available on MySec2, MySec TV or the Cybersecurity Weekly Podcast. So Niall, without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to you. If you wanna share your screen and walk us through fraud prevention with a focus on customer experience. And like I said, uh, if there's any questions from the audience, fire them through and also any comments, uh, welcome to let us know where you're listening from uh, or what issues might pertain to you. Thanks Niall, over to you. Perfect, thank you, Chris. Yep. Um, hi everyone, good to have you on board today and hopefully this will be an insightful session for you. Um, as Chris mentioned, do feel free to ask any questions. As a means of introducing uh, myself first, so you know who's talking to you, uh, my name is Niall Whelan, I, I head up our data science team here in APAC for ICATA. Uh, and essentially, um, I've been working in the fraud industry previously with device companies and now in the digital identity space. Um, and my focus is to really get uh, the ICATA clients to essentially leverage our data in the most efficient and best way possible on a day-to-day -day basis so that we reduce fraud and we identify friction um, as easily as possible and as efficiently from a client perspective. So my day-to-day -day work, work revolves really around the data elements of that. And today really looking to cover off a couple of areas. Just to set some context, talk about a market overview, what's happened in the last couple of years, the last two years really since COVID has uh, come into play has really been a, a dynamic shift in, in the industry. And so how that impacts on the friction perspective on customer experience and also around the, the just growth in the number of uh, customers on, online. Uh, we'll then go into the uh, cost of fraud detection when you look at false positives and then just a couple of pocket stories to really give you a a day-to-day -day perspective, I suppose, what actually happens with some of the customers I've worked with and how we've, we've looked at this and, and solved some of the problems. So some of you may not have heard of ICATA. Um, so to, to kind of give you context on who we are, essentially delivering the aim from an ICATA perspective is to deliver the best in class identity verification that reduce customer friction and prevent fraud globally. And that is kind of key is that global element. So working both in the e-commerce space with in Australia, for example, Super Retail Group and Meyer. Um, when we look at FinTech, Ant Group is a major client for us here in, in the Asia Pacific region. Um, and also in the, the buy now, pay later space, Hum Group in Australia will be another example. So working with all these customers essentially to look at different types of fraud they see, and then obviously to make sure that they don't have high friction environments for their customers. With ICADA, to kind of just set the context of where we sit as well, but the different types of data we will focus on, uh, and today we can kind of talk about a couple of these, but many of you will be aware of the internal data you have available to you for fraud detection. That can be your customer relationship data, um, all of the blacklisting information from previous frauds, and that is key. And first of all, I would say that any anyone looking to solve a, a problem with, with customer friction or with high false positives, looking at your internal data and, and leveraging that to its fullest is definitely the first step. Then when we look at the third party data that, that is usable and used across the market that we work with, um, from right to left, you look at device fingerprinting and as Dan Zhao, our head of sales would say, it's, it's almost table stakes now. Everyone generally uses a device solution as kind of a, a starting point. Um, on top of that, you look at the behavioral biometrics space and, you know, for example, New Data, um, a MasterCard company as well, um, essentially they leverage the, the biometric side of things. So when you're on a website, when you're making a purchase, when you're creating an account, how do you interact? What's the behavioral patterns that are developing there? 
And then finally, on the third element of those, the third party data side of things, we look at the user input identity data. And for context, this is where ECATA essentially sits. And what we really talk about here is when you're inputting into creating the account, the name, phone, email address that you input, the IP address associated to it. So that user input identity data essentially to maximize the patterns that develop there and also the linkages between those. And what's key is that none of these, um, none of these data types are completely separate. You really need to use them in combination. So for example, the different touch points you'll see as an account opening, for example, a user input identity data and the biometrics may be very important device less so. Whereas at a login, when you're protecting the account from account takeover, device may be more important. And then a transaction, you may want to use a suite of all three to essentially maximize the information you have at one of the highest risk touch points. So as we go through today, we'll kind of talk about some of the, these areas in particular. So to set kind of context on the markets, as we've kind of seen in the last two years, essentially, when we talk about what's happened with COVID, with the pandemic, and just the move to digital, essentially, what we're seeing is this huge growth in customers. And this is a huge number, 2 billion customers shopped on, our consumers shopped online. But if you think about it from uh, an e-commerce or a financial services company, the addressable market has dramatically increased. So you've seen a huge number of, of potential customers that are now shopping online are now available for you to interact with online. And that comes with massive potential, huge growth opportunities, uh, and a huge new set of customers that really you can you know, maximize your, your potential in terms of revenue from there. But that also comes with a, a huge problem in terms of as this huge scaling of, of customers available to you, how do you deal with that? And the systems you're using two years ago before COVID happened may not necessarily be able to deal with this huge increase in volume, whether that is from a customer experience or a fraud perspective. If you were, for example, leveraging a manual review perspective previously and manual reviewing X number of cases, as your number of population of um, customers grow, you may not be able to scale that. And so this comes with problems and we'll talk about that in a few minutes in particular. And when we look at the Asia Pacific region in in general and specifically in Asia Pacific, we see 18% increase um, year over year for 2020 against 19. And that's that's massive, that's a huge growth. Um, and that comes across you know, the, the different kind of areas we've seen around uh, in China in particular, massive growth there, but also we've seen in Australia, we see a lot of growth potential there and in particular buy now pay later coming through as being kind of a, a huge uh, mechanism to leverage kind of different financial payments within the e-commerce space. And so we're able to say that actually the, the growth has outpaced some of the other more traditional markets um, for e-commerce. So the America is not quite as large. Uh, and this is definitely a huge opportunity and definitely something that's within the Asia Pacific region we're very conscious of and very keen to, to make sure that we are on top of this growth. And then we talk about where exactly people are worried. So if you think about from a fraud perspective and take, about, take a step back and go, where actually are we seeing this, the major issues occurring? And with two key areas, we've talk, spoken to a lot, of, um, a lot of the companies we work with, and we focus on synthetic identity fraud and account protection, the two things that keep coming up. And we talk about synthetic identity, that's essentially fraudsters creating a, a Frankenstein of a, an ID, taking, for example, Chris's, email, my phone number, a drop-off address for shipping, leveraging those to essentially create an ID that will pass checks through. So being able to pass fraud checks while also being able to get the goods out without triggering any fraud rules. So essentially synthetic IDs are, are really kind of a, a mechanism that fraudsters are using. And how they're doing that is essentially leveraging the data that's available from some of the data breaches that have occurred in the last few years as these have scaled to just a massive number of identities that have gone out into the into the ecosystem and onto the dark web leveraging those to create these synthetic ids the second area is really around account protection so from the creation of an account whether that be on an e-commerce site or on a financial services site the creation of the account to avoiding it being taken over essentially lever maximizing the protection that you can put onto an account so that you don't end up having that really bad customer experience of, oh, someone has hacked into my account, has taken you know, my credit card details, has made a transaction and shipped something to themselves, or has hacked into my bank account, taken the money out, and I'm left with nothing. 
telecom protection piece is absolutely massive as frauds just become more and more craftier and taking more and more um, or leverage more and more advanced technologies. Um, and that is really kind of a, you know, an interesting kind of change we've seen recently. Um, as fraudsters are taking over more accounts, they're leveraging more of the cutting edge, te edge technologies, whether that be remote access tools for banking um, or leveraging kind of scripted attacks to access um, e-commerce accounts. We see the, the trend going towards more technology, technology savvy fraudsters, which means obviously as someone fighting against fraudsters, you need to be more savvy and more aware of what exactly they are leveraging to target you. And obviously then in the center, we see this huge number in terms of $206 billion of losses. Um, and that's a huge amount of, of value. And for any given company, uh, that, do that dollar value will be less for them, but it's still a huge amount uh, of potential losses that could be targeted by fraudsters. With that, and with this increase in fraud has also come just rising customer expectations. Uh, I don't know about anyone else on this call, but for me, if something is not a simple, easy kind of click that you experience on Amazon or on um, Spotify, you know, if it's not really that easy kind of click at the moment, you feel like you're missing out. And I think a lot of consumers have that as well, where the expectation has gone from sometimes a you know, a bit of patience with the system to allow it to kind of go through the steps to now a very much a, a one-click expectation. Amazon is the, the obvious example where, you know, I can click and I have my item delivered the next day. And I think as a company competing with some of these big brands, customer experience is, is the basics at this stage. Trying to get that, minimize the, the impact, minimize the friction, um, and really kind of give these as close an experience or better an experience where possible than some of these really big brands. Uh, and this is where we'll talk about today is to make sure that we don't impact those customers in a way that will get, will force them to kind of move to one of these large brands that have this experience. And then finally, just before we move into kind of the, the, the hands-on approach of how we deal with it, the key areas we want to talk about when we, we meet our customers a lot in the e-commerce space, you know, the importance of trust. One of the key things is if I'm going to hand over my data to you, if I'm creating an account with with an e-commerce brand or a financial service, I don't want you to lose my data. I don't want it to go out into the dark web. I don't want it to be leveraged for phishing attacks on me. I don't want to see you know, a phone, a phone number from somewhere random calling me up and trying to get my data out of me. That is you know, not really the, the type of activity you want to see. But then comes friction. And then is customers coming into e-commerce and seeing, oh, I have a high friction environment. I have to do an OTP every time I make a transaction. That is not what I want to do. I don't want to have to, to log into my banking app every time I, I need to make a, a transaction on e-commerce. That adds a couple of extra seconds and just doesn't feel very smooth. And then finally, concerns about fraud. And what's interesting about this is that most people think about if you're in the fraud industry, oh, I need to stop fraud. But actually, when we, sorry, when we talk about fraud perspective, sometimes fraud is actually is really important, but it's also the reduction of friction and making sure that you're very precise in how you, you determine fraud is actually as important. And what we've seen when we talk to customers is essentially that 92% of people really want a fast frictionless experience, but they also want to be trustworthy and secure as possible. And that's a, that's a, a difficult thing to, to achieve, essentially. How do you get both of those at the same time? And I take it you're going to cover that, Niall, in terms of that, because it's one of those uh, security and convenience is always that trade-off that people want. But I suppose when their money's at front front of mind and they're making a transaction, trust. So where's where does that balance go, do you think? Uh, stronger in the trust or stronger in the convenience in terms of e-commerce uh, and what we've seen in the last sort of 12, 18 months? Yeah, I think, I think actually, Chris, and we'll talk about in a few minutes, was essentially measuring the problem. So if you look at your fraud problem, what's my dollar loss associated to fraud? And that's relatively easy. It could be chargebacks. You can measure the, the cost of that. But then you actually want to go and measure what's the cost of these false positives? What's the loss of the customer value that I would potentially have gotten from this person if I hadn't blocked them? And then obviously on scale, what does that accumulate to? And if you yeah. look at the overalls, how do we get to a point where actually the balance between those losses is, is relatively well measured and well managed. And that's a difficult, it's not easy to, to get to that point, but I think we'll talk today about some of the steps you can use to get to that measurement and get to that kind of equation, essentially. And that's where that data science comes in, right? You should have an answer and you should be able to monitor that in near real time. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. 
Perfect. Um, and then finally, I think this is where we, we really want to talk to as well today. I think what I see in the industry a lot of is this pendulum effect. It's that really reactive approach where, oh, I have a fraud problem. Oh, I better start solving it now. And then we don't really think about what's the impact on customer experience. And in two months time, perhaps you'll see, oh, wait a minute, that problem I solved two months ago has just created another problem in that I'm rejecting a whole heap of customers. All the fraudsters have adapted and moved on and fraudsters are adaptable. And essentially I've moved on to, um, I've moved on to something else and I'm just blocking a couple of good customers and I'm continuing to, to impact them even long after the fraudsters are no longer leveraging that channel. And you end up having that pendulum effect of back and forth. What you really want to do is have a strategic approach that doesn't end up creating this pendulum, that you actually have a real-time monitoring or a productive a production system that is monitoring on a consistent basis to make sure that you don't um, overly impact to one side. You, you maintain your fraud, but you also maintain the good customer experience at a reasonable level, minimizing false positives, essentially. So let's talk about the cost of fraud, essentially. So when we look at friction and what actually you know, is the cost of fraud detection and how we can minimize that cost as much as possible. And let's look at what is a false positive. So I don't want to make any assumptions here. I want to very simply go into what is a false positive. So if we take the example, a very simple example of an e-commerce company, and they will make a decision either to accept or reject the customer coming in. And if you think it's a fraudster, you will naturally look and reject that customer and say, this is a fraudster. I do not want them interacting on my website. The problem comes is obviously when you've gotten that wrong. You've essentially said, this is a fraudster, I want to block them, but in reality, it's a good customer. And so therefore you've ended up creating a false positive, creating a negative impact. Um, and this customer may never end up interacting with your website again. They may go to e-commerce company X or Y that doesn't do this to them, which is a, a pretty natural experience. One customer, probably not the biggest deal in the world. You can deal with losing one customer. It's when you get to scale. When this happens and you're actually blocking more good customers than you are fraudsters. That's where this really causes a major issue. And the business impact essentially is the, the lost revenue from that customer, and that's obviously important. Um, but really it's the poor customer experience and the reputational damage as well. The intangible is almost in terms of what the loss is. So essentially in the modern day that we live in, if you block a whole host of good customers and they all go on to whatever the, the favorite social media site is, and you end up having that huge reputational damage and you end up turning customer, future customers away, um, because they just don't want to have that negative experience. They want to go somewhere where they will have that. And that is the real business impact on top of the lost revenue, the intangibles that come with that. And when we talk about the revenue side of things, um, you'll see here that actually the cost of revenue loss to false positives is about 10x that of cost of fraud. And that, that may seem counterintuitive. It's like, how do you use 10x more? But in reality, what we see and time and again, many of my clients will come to me and say, we have a major fraud problem. And then when we start to look at the data, it's actually, wait a minute, we're seeing 10, 15 X times more loss on false positives. And we're not even recognizing it as a problem. And some of that comes from simply not measuring it, not understanding that until you get to the point of, of measurement. But time and again, we do see this playing out. And you'll see you know, these massive numbers, 28 billion and 30 billion. But if you take it back to the level of your company or your, your website, that's a, a 10x losses or 10x more loss on, on false positives is a huge issue. Um, and so we really want to focus on that and reducing that where possible. So how do we go about doing that? This is really where we want to get into the meat of the, the presentation today. So first of all, I'm going to take the strategic view of it. So we'll take the strategic view and then we'll jump into kind of tactically applying that on a day-to-day -day basis. So first of all, we do need to acknowledge that 100% acceptance of good customers is impossible, particularly as you scale to any type of medium or large business. And acknowledging that and just saying that I want to minimize it, I don't want to completely remove all of the acceptance of good customers. The best way to do so is to accept everything and obviously have a, a large fraud problem. We want to make sure that you can kind of accept at a reasonable level while acknowledging that you will probably never get to 100% acceptance. On top of that, being proactive and not reactive. As I mentioned, that pendulum effect previously, being proactive and having a, a look at the, the fraud problems you're facing and are likely to face in the future, as well as how best to, to impact, um, reduce impact on good customers. And taking that at a strategic level, identifying the solutions you need, identifying 
how best to leverage those solutions in a way that is proactive and you're not being reactive to everything that occurs. On top of that, avoiding over-reliance on any one tool. Um, and what we see a lot of the time that causes this problem is essentially, I have one tool, I'm an e-commerce merchant and I have one tool and I'm going to leverage that to its fullest. I'm going to get every bit of value from that tool. But actually what ends up happening is you end up over-relying on those, those indicators you have from that tool. And they end up giving you kind of a, a very good possible fraud detection because you're blocking a lot of the fraud, but you end up relying on that too much and the false positives tend to be quite high from that. So spreading, essentially spreading out across several tools or several data sets or whatever um, applications you're using to essentially not have that problem occur and essentially balancing uh, and not having all of your eggs in one basket, essentially. And then finally, that network effect. And this is really key because for false positives, you look at a new customer coming onto your website. If I, under, if I know nothing about that customer, it's very hard for me to make a decision. It's very hard for me to understand it. But really, if I look at that customer's activity outside of my ecosystem, in the broader eco, digital ecosystem, that network activity can be key. If, for example, Chris, if you are signing up to a new buy now, pay later service, and this buy now, pay later knows nothing about you, but you consistently transact with e-commerce merchants, you travel regularly, you have a bank account, and you're doing all of this digital activity on a regular basis in a normal pattern. If you as a buy now, pay later customer, a buy now, pay later platform can leverage that data, get access to it and make a decision based on what, uh, Chris, you are doing across the ecosystem, that increases the ability to detect a good customer in particular quite well, as well as a fraudster, but really it is key in terms of identifying that good behavior. And that's where really the benefits come from. How easy is it to set up that network activity or sharing that, that data? Is it the anonymized data or you know, how, what's that process to go through to, to find those partners in a network? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There is the security concerns that come with that. And um, from an ICASA perspective, and, and even in previous companies I've worked in, um, the hashing of data, encryption and hashing of data, um, and leveraging those hashes, essentially. So you normalize the data, you hash it, and then from there, you're able to see velocities, volatilities, um, how popular that ID is across different um, different e-commerce companies and that. So yes, um, that is kind of the key to it and making sure that you are, if you're buying into a network, you want to make sure that you're in a secure and safe network as the level of trust will build. Yeah, and I imagine uh, just having a look at the audience profile, there's some from quite relatively large uh, organizations, but they're part of a subsidiary. So, you know, imagine even with your partners within your own sort of company network, uh, you can start to talk to, you, you might have established relationships there as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, and getting that information can be really valuable. Uh, and even kind of simple data points at the beginning can make a huge difference um, to actually identifying very simple trends that can pick up some simple false positives. Yep. Perfect. And overall, this leads to, you know, a, a general high level fraud strategy that gets you to where you need to be. Um, and so essentially strategically looking at this and taking a step back from the day-to-day, -day. because if you look at a day-to-day -day level, which we'll talk about in a minute, you get lost in dealing with the individual fraud trends that are occurring at this time and can get caught up in that and therefore lose sight of kind of the overall false positive problem. So when we take about, when we take that and put it into action then, so we actually look at the day-to-day, -day, what are kind of the steps, the proactive steps we can take? And first of all, really simply, is to actually track false positive cases. This isn't always easy because if you think about it, if you're a, say we're a, a e-commerce company and we essentially want to allow transactions, but we obviously want to have rejected some transactions up to now, the false positives occur on the cases that you have rejected. And so actually you've never had the proof point. That person has never had the possibility to go on and commit fraud or not commit fraud. And so you have to create a feedback loop to say, how do I identify if this customer had the opportunity to make the transaction, if we'd allowed them to make the transaction, if we had accepted them, how do I identify if they would have committed fraud or not? So tracking false positives is really key. That's actually one of the more difficult parts because getting this in play then allows the rest of the steps to flow. Once you start tracking, it's then measuring. And measuring is key because when we talked about that 10x loss, uh, 10x value loss compared to fraud, measuring allows you to actually get to the point where you can say, for me as a company, what is the value I'm losing here? And then really developing balanced fraud rules or models. We'll give an example of that in a few minutes. 
which will allow us to kind of talk to how any company can kind of really focus on that. And then really continuously doing this because we don't want to be reactive. We want to be proactive and iterating through this process. So we talk tracking false positives. First of all, in the most simple way and, and where most people start is call center tracking. So as you see um, good customers phoning up and saying, hey, you've just blocked my transaction. I'm a good customer. I want to transact with you. That's a really easy and simple indicator of where exactly the false positives are coming from. Um, taking that and feeding it back into your, your data science team, your fraud analyst team, allows you to essentially identify that there might be a false positive problem. And then reanalysis by senior agents. So if you've got manual review agents and you want to just reanalyze these cases and say, actually, did we get this wrong? So was there the possibility this is a good customer? Have we lost this customer? Have they gone to somewhere else? Reanalysis is key because there allows you to say, I'm confident that this is a false positive and we can therefore identify a population of good customers that we could potentially accept in the future. And you don't want to just trust that straight off and go, I'm going to accept all of these customers now that I used to reject just based on the, the re reanalysis. You want to create a control group, an A-B test perhaps, which essentially says, I previously rejected this customer. We now think it's good, but we're only going to do this on a small population to start with. I'm going to control the flow of data from accept or from reject into accepted cases. Um, and that can be on the friction side as well. It can be previously we applied a one-time password. We applied additional friction, whereas now we're going to say, okay, let's actually um, allow this person through on a less, a lower friction path, and let's do it at a control level. Because if you open the floodgates, naturally you can create this wave of fraud that would just flow through and can overwhelm your system and you end up back as, as a major problem. Uh, so control group groups are really a key and probably one of the industry standards. You'll hear called A-B tests, different forms of control groups, but essentially that's a key mechanism that's used by many of our customers. Once you've done that, once you've started to identify exactly where the problems are and how, how big it is in terms of the volume or the number of customers, it's then really about measuring it. And actually it's really about getting a dollar value. So if you know what your chargeback volume is as an e-commerce company, or your dollar loss as a financial service, you then want to know in terms of what's the, the value you've lost from false positives. When we look at it from a, just taking a, a very simple e-commerce example here, taking your customer acquisition cost, the customer lifetime value, and identifying that for one customer, and then multiplying it out essentially by the total number of transactions that you have false positives on based on the analysis you'll have done from the previous slide. That gets you to a, a dollar value essentially at the end of that that can give you a an indicator, and we're not looking for perfection here. False positives are sometimes easy to, to measure completely accurately. We're looking really to get an indicator. And if, for example, this dollar loss that you're assigning to your false declines is 10 times or 20 times more than the fraud value you're, you're currently identifying, then actually you probably have a major problem. And this is where you really need to start, need to start taking action. And this is key because otherwise you're in the dark and you're really just hoping for the best essentially on when you move cases from a false positive to a, a acceptance, um, you really are just hoping for the best and you don't want to do that. Not, this is your business the, case really, isn't it? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And on a day-to-day -day basis, this is key because otherwise if the fraud problem is low and you're making the case for essentially saying, what is the, what is the reason I would take this action to increase the number of acceptances, but take a risk of increasing more fraud, why would I do that if I don't have a business case behind it? And here's where we, we really look at that. Just open to the audience there if there's any questions on this particular aspect, but I imagine it makes sense, but particularly even any comments if you've seen this type of uh, process before and whether you've gone through it and whether it's working you up. It's a bit of a wake up call, I imagine, for some businesses to just do a simple uh, uh, sort of measurement like this as well. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the, the first things I'll always do as part of any analysis for a customer is we look at the fraud and we'll absolutely do that. But secondly, I'll go, what are the, the number of cases rejected and how high do we expect the false positives to be there? Um, because that's a looking at that gives you an indicator of, you know, we should be doing this type of analysis. Do we have these numbers available to us um, to essentially give the full picture? Even I imagine getting the acquisition and lifetime costs is a challenge as well. Um, where, where might you, where would be some of the sources of, of information for that? Is that the sales teams, uh, your marketing teams as well? 
Yes, absolutely. Um, so custom, customer acquisition costs in particular, focusing on the marketing value, uh, how much essentially it's, it's taking to get any customer into the website. Lifetime value is slightly easier. You generally tend to take the average of what the, uh, an average customer would spend on your website over X number of years, depending again on their um, but the acquisition is a bit more vague and sometimes a bit difficult to get um, exact numbers to any one customer. But it tends to be, there are some industry standards for creating this, but it tends to be focused on what is the marketing and sales cost to getting that customer onto your website. I, I suppose you could even start with just a basic, you know, what's your annual sales and marketing costs and then divide by how many customers you've got and that's your annual uh, sort of cost there as well. Yep, absolutely. And, and that's a very simplified view of it, but it's a it's yeah. a very good starting point of nothing. Yeah, well, I think uh, you get an indication if that potential revenue loss is nine point six million. Uh, you only need to start with those bigger numbers to know if you need to dig deeper. So yeah, it's a good one. Yep. Perfect. Once you've done that, it's then about really crazy around developing that balance for all rules. So. Just to explain this, I've taken a very simple, this is a customer example where uh, an account opening um, use case where they were declining or approving a customer to their website. And essentially they had a problem where they had relatively high frauds. So they had a high number of frauds and we were able to, to identify those, but they actually had a huge number of registrations that were later identified as being false positives. And from our perspective, the approach is that we want to have this circular motion where on the bottom, we're actually, the bottom arrow is essentially saying we're detecting, you know, 296 of the frauds. We're able to move those into decline. And some of those we will increase with false positives. There'll be 172 good customers that we would decline based on this. But on the top, you're seeing here that actually the focus from us was actually to move a large number of these customers that were previously declined. And we have a small number of suspected frauds. So we will always have that balancing act to manage. But essentially, you're creating this, this cycle where every time you move frauds into your decline bucket, you also move cases, good cases, uh, into your approvals. And those cases are, there is a suspected fraud. You aren't able to put an exact number on that, but you are able to say, we're, we're very confident that some of these cases, um, that the, a low number of these cases, sorry, will be um, fraudsters and the majority, the vast majority in this instance will be good customers. I'll talk a, a second in a, in a second as to how exactly we do that. Um, but this is kind of the framework you really want to set up as part of any improvements to your, your rules or your models. You really want to be able to say, what is the impact on both sides of the scales? And if you can imagine a, a scales here, you're really looking at good customers on one side versus your rejected uh, or suspected frauds on the other. And when we take this, let's take this down a level deeper and say, actually, how do I go about doing this? So this is a, a, an example from one of our customers in China. Uh, and essentially, when we look at this, we have the accepted transactions here. And we've broken out all of their accepted transactions between fraud and good. So the fraudsters uh, on the top here and the good customers on the bottom. And what we have is our two ICATA scores, the identity risk score and the identity network score, which are machine learning scores that we derive from our customer base, essentially on the fraud labels we see. And when we look at this on the top right, you'll see on the red, all of the fraudsters are towards a high identity risk score and a relatively high identity network score. So that really dark shade you see on the top right hand corner. And that's exactly what we expect. We want for our scores to be detecting fraudsters as high risk. So the higher the score, the higher the risk. Um, and particularly when both scores are indicating that it's, it's a negative um, indicator that they would actually be fraudsters. So these confirmed fraudsters are, are well identified by this particular graph. But where I actually want to focus on is down in the bottom left-hand corner. So where you look on the red chart in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see there isn't much fraudster sitting in there. There isn't any real fraudster sitting in there. It was a very low percentage. When we look at the same space on the bottom chart of good customers, you'll notice that actually it's the heat map is very, very bright or very, very dark, sorry. Um, so there's a lot of customers sitting in those very positive score ranges. So from 0, 0.4, 0 to 0 0.4 on the network score, 0, point, uh, 0 to 200 on the uh, risk score, you'll see that there's a lot of the good customers there. And so you can essentially identify that as an area of positive, so an area of low risk, not many fraudsters there. And that's great on your accepted transactions, that's good to know. Everything is going as, as you would like, and you can use the top right-hand section to identify the fraud. But what you really want to do is to actually map this onto your rejected transactions. So the transactions you've rejected up till now. 
And when you do that, you see that actually there's a pretty similar kind of um, color map here. So you can see that actually you would probably expect that the top right hand corner will probably be fraudsters. But on the bottom left, you can be reasonably confident that actually this area here is actually made up of the majority of good customers. And so if you in, intend on improving the, uh, reducing the number of false positives, an area of focus would be to say, this bottom left-hand corner of the rejected transactions is where I would look to actually accept these going forward with a high confidence that these customers will end up being good and not commit fraud against me. And this is the type of analysis we do on a day-to-day -day basis to essentially say, how can I be confident when I accept these customers that they will in fact be good? And you may end up wanting to use a control group or an A-B test. You won't want to accept these all straight off the bat, but you are essentially saying that I've identified a portion of customers, a population that gives me confidence in the long run that I will be able to accept them going forward. Would you take it another level to look at why they're being rejected and then overlay that to these? And then you understand it might be a glitch in your own process? Yep, absolutely. Some of that is actually, there may be existing rules, for example, Chris, that are in play. And actually, you may want to temper those rules by applying this logic that if it sits within these ranges, don't reject them. Continue yeah. to reject as you're going forward. These rules make sense, but they are overfiring. They are um, creating too many false positives. And so you want to just temper them a the small bit to be more fine-tuned and precise. Do you find it also changes country to country or yes. sector to sector, maybe? Yes, absolutely. Um, the fraud population in Singapore is very, very different to the fraud population in Australia, for example. Yeah. Um, and we tend to see different kind of behaviors, different patterns. Um, Singapore is a high step up mentality where you're stepped up for a, a one time password quite regularly. Whereas in Australia, for example, it is less so, although becoming a bit more of the norm with some of the, the regulations we're seeing. Um, in Southeast Asia, we see di different trends as well. Um, and so actually, yes, on a country by country level, very much need to take that into account. And industry by industry, there is no one rule fits all, unfortunately. If yeah. there was, my job would be relatively straightforward and, and not much need for me. I'd imagine also the cost of what's been purchased. So industry to industry, you know, lower cost consumer goods versus higher value, uh, you know, the online shopping, would, that, that's the COVID sort of scenario that would, you know, people are buying expensive handbags, for example, you know, $15,000 type uh, items that they would normally go into the shop for they might now be starting to buy. So the fraudsters are probably more attracted to that type of low volume, high return. Absolutely, absolutely. And we see that across not just transactions, we see it across promotion and voucher abuse on e-commerce sites where fraudsters don't want to target the really low value vouchers. You see it on the really high value, the premium vouchers you can, can um, attain, which are more difficult, but fraudsters are tending to willing to put in that extra effort to get the high value returns. Yeah. Uh, and the, the fraud trends there are very, very different compared to what you would see on lower value um, vouchers, for example. Same I with think transactions. The only other thing I've noticed, particularly with COVID, is the rapid change in fraud behavior. You know, we've seen it in cybersecurity where, you know, COVID has seen a massive uptake and we are seeing more e-commerce fraud in response to COVID. So being able to monitor particular changes and fraud behavior early can save you a lot of money as well. So yeah, it's one of those things that's well worth keeping on top of. Yep, yeah, and we, we do that quite regularly where we would look at, for example, month over month or quarter over quarter, how does this distribution change? Um, how does this fraud distribution change? If you look at the top left-hand chart here, if say for example, this is the, the chart currently and in a month's time, that really dark red dot starts to move further left or further down, then you can start to see maybe there's a fraud trend developing that's changing. Yeah. And what we do um, generally is we our models are, are updated quite regularly to essentially capture the latest fraud trends. You don't want to be sitting there for years using the same model or the same rules because fraudsters will develop. And in, in the recent years, uh, in the last two years, essentially, we have seen a remarkable change, particularly as more people come online, the general uh, distributions of the population are changing. So for example, more people who would never have been online previously and maybe are higher risk because of that. And also people who are coming into new kind of transaction types. The buy now, pay later is attracting a, a lot of uh, younger users, newer users who maybe are much more tech savvy. And so maybe, maybe able to, to do stuff that previously wouldn't have been common. 
And actually, it looks a lot like some of the stuff that fraudsters will be doing. Yeah. So using my favorite is a VPN usage, um, whereas a lot more people are starting to use VPNs to protect their identity. That's something that you know, fraudsters have been doing for a very long time, uh, are bouncing VPN, bouncing IP ranges. So this is something that we see more and more of, and it's a, it's a challenge, and it's just recognizing that, recognizing what this activity looks like. So you don't impact all these new customers coming online. Very good. Perfect. And then finally, we talk about continuously monitoring and iterating. You don't want to stop and just say, oh, I've done a great job. Let's not do anything else. You want to monitor this. You want to track it, see how performance uh, goes over time, and then update on a regular schedule that makes sense for your business. And that may differ depending on your business type. But again, you'll, you'll probably know that best from as you start to see fraud increase or the false positive rates increase, it's probably start, time to start looking at when exactly you, you need to do the updates. So just to take a next step is actually look at some of the pocket stories. And this is just based on some of the cases I've worked with previously. Um, so we, the first case is a, an Australian e-commerce merchant. And essentially, they had a massive false positive problem. Um, and the false positives were coming through actual manual review. They were manually reviewing a large number of cases for transactions. And that's fine if you're a relatively small company or you're growing and you, you haven't got to the point where this becomes an issue where you have to hire lots and lots of people to manually review cases. But with everything that's happened in the last couple of years, and this is relatively recent, um, the number of transactions they were dealing with was getting to a scale that just didn't work. You couldn't continuously to manual review. You couldn't scale your business to do so. So they came to us with the problem of, Nile, we cannot continue to do this. And so what we looked at was actually their existing rule set. So they have a pretty good rule set and it worked pretty well until COVID came along and kind of messed up everything in terms of the, their volumes and the, the different velocities they were seeing. And what we actually looked at was taking the, our feature was actually email first seen dates. And that email is actually when it was first seen in the ACATA network across all of our 1,500 customers. And essentially saying emails that have been seen for a long time with positive behavior, you can trust them more essentially. Whereas newer emails, you know, auto-generated, fake emails, stuff that is easy to uh, um, create from a fraudster's, fraudster's perspective, tend to be higher risk. And using that, just that feature, we were able to actually identify um, a reduction in 50% on the manual review queue they had, accepting those transactions, essentially. So you've moved those transactions into acceptance. And so therefore, reduce the friction, because the customer, when it was being manually reviewed, would have to wait or wouldn't receive confirmation of the, the purchase and reducing the amount of time you're spending on those um, cases for your manual review agents and allowing them to essentially target the cases that are actually higher risk. Uh, and that really was a benefit on both sides of the equation. The manual review agents can spend more time focusing on high risk cases. Your customers end up having a better experience. And overall, you feel like um, you can feel more confident in your, your fraud decisioning platform. This was a really good case for us in, in a pretty large e-commerce company in Australia. Second example I'll give today, um, the, in Asia Pacific Travel Company, this was actually two years ago now, just before COVID is, um, and essentially we looked at frictionless approvals. So as you're purchasing online, how can you make this as frictionless as possible? So you don't want to have to do, uh, you know, take a, a picture of your passport, take a, a, a picture of yourself or, or send kind of a, a additional checks like an OTP, uh, a one-time password, sorry. So they had a real problem with that where a lot of their customers were dropping off because of these additional checks. And so essentially the aim was how do you reduce this to a point where we don't have to, to step up everyone or we don't have to step up a large portion of our population. And essentially what we did was we looked at using the identity risk score, identity network score to essentially say, how do we identify customers who are acting in a positive manner across all of the different e-commerce, um, online uh, financial services? How do we identify those to essentially say, this, this person is not a, someone you should step up? And we were able to identify 18.7% um, of customers that we could step, we could remove the step up, frictionless, improve, uh, frictionless um, approvals while keeping fraud constant. And so those 18.7% of your customers previously had to face this terrible step of having, oh, I have to take a picture of my passport. I have to find my passport to take the picture. I have to do all this, you know, um, unnecessary steps. This allowed them to essentially create um, this much better experience and therefore have customers that will continue to transact with them and continue to use their services, uh, which is key as you, you look to go through a pandemic, you want to maintain as much of a customer experience as possible. And when you come out the other side, hopefully, um, have these customers continue to transact with you. Not sure if that's a 
typo is that AUC is that supposed to be just AU nope that is AUC that is area under the curve which is oh. a data science metric um, <laughs> I knew that, <laughs> I probably didn't like that huh? I'm glad uh, I asked yes so essentially we were able to provide a 7.5 percent uplift and that's for for the data scientists out there on the call essentially moving that um that rock curve in the right direction so towards the top left um, and really quite positive from, from this particular company. They were quite positive with this. It was a, a pre-sales engagement and they signed on and have seen this um, really kind of coming out to fruition as part of the, the work we've done with them. What would have been a dollar figure that might have been associated with that in terms of business? Yeah, we didn't get a dollar figure for this particular one because from their perspective, it was actually a lot of it was really the customers were talking about how they were getting complaints. They were saying, I don't have my passport available. I'm ringing up. Uh, onto the their, essentially our call centers who then had to deal Got with it. these particular cases. Uh, it was really around the the reduction of this really negative image that was seen. Got it. Uh, and it was almost an, an image perspective. So we're, you know, from their perspective, getting a lot of social media complaints. It's like, oh, why do we have, why do I have to deal with this? Like, why do I have to take this extra step? I really don't want to. Can you help me sort this? It gives a never negative perception. It was actually very much a perception perspective. Got it. Perfect. So finally, just to summarize, and I do want to leave some time at the end for everyone to ask questions. Um, essentially, the next steps in getting started on this for any company who's not tracking false positives, um, the first thing I always recommend is let's start tracking. Using the mechanisms around your manual review agents, your call center, um, starting some very simple A-B tests or, or to uh, control groups to manage this. And then essentially measuring the cost of your business. So taking that and applying a dollar value associated to it, um, really kind of getting you to a point where you can say, this is the cost of these false positives. And then identifies the areas. So based on when you're, where you're tracking, where are the areas that you, your manual review agents, your call centers, um, the control groups you've identified, where are the areas that are actually proving to be the key points of false positive? How you kind of identify those and then proactively create rules, update your models, and iterate over them in the long term, uh, not sitting back and saying, I've solved the problem now because fraudsters will react to your changes and they will proactively do something different that will essentially mean that some of the changes you'll make now will be redundant in you know, X number of months or years. And so being consistently um, proactive about that is important. Perfect. That's it in terms of the presentation, but Chris, if there's any questions coming through, um, we'd be really keen to hear feedback on the audience. And if there's yeah, any look, very much welcome questions from the audience. I had maybe just go back to that previous slide. Sorry, sure. um, but yeah, any any questions from the audience that are with us now? And like I said, there's some here from uh, you know quite branded agencies. Where in the business would this generally start? Say, start tracking false positives. I noticed you're a, a data scientist and you come in at, from that perspective, but that's from a fraud prevention focus, but from the business, would you find it's the business analyst or this is a CFO directed uh, approach? Yeah, where in the business do you tend to, to deal with mainly? Yeah, so essentially with, with larger organizations, it'll tend to be that fraud team, the, the fraud analysts and the business analysts that will sit within the fraud. However, from a, you know, from a, a financial perspective, we do tend to see some interest from CFOs because naturally you want to maximize the value you get from all the good customers and fraud, fraud detection, if it is creating a large number of false positives can be working against that. So we tend to see perhaps the, um, the head of finance, the head of product as well. Um, so product focused people may actually sit there and go, we have a false positive problem. We've built this really good product. We've got this, these different paths. We've got a high friction path where we we'll end up pushing way too many people down this, this one-time password path, um, which isn't designed for this volume. So we tend to see kind of that type of um, profile as well. Um, and then obviously within the fraud team, you can see fraud analysts, manual review agents, or the data science team themselves. So a data science team may need more data because they may not have that available to them to essentially identify these false positives. Have you found a bit of a change with uh, the likes of, say, Akata with the uptake to the cloud, digital transformation, alongside uh, the move for e-commerce? And a lot of businesses have you know, moved to that online environment, but they're also moving to the cloud. So their data points are, are more. Are you finding that as well, that from the business perspective, they're asking more questions. Something we've covered recently is data literacy. 
So the businesses are becoming more literate in their data and then therefore they're drilling down a bit deeper? Completely. Yes, I think the point around data literacy, I absolutely agree with. I think, and even in the few years I've been, been working in fraud, I've noticed a big change from customers are much more um, detail focused on what exactly the data points are. What is this data actually adding in terms of value and how does how do we generate it? Where is it coming from? Um, and that's kind of something that's definitely been a noticeable uptake. I think it comes simply from just the awareness of what's out there, the awareness that comes from having, you know, a vast array of data available to you through whatever cloud platform you're using. Okay, well, look, there's no other questions from the audience. The only other one I had was, Ikeda, how, how do you go to market? Are you part of a channel or it's direct? I noticed you're a MasterCard company now. Uh, and we briefly covered this in our last interview, but yeah, maybe just explain Ikeda and how, uh, you sort of go to market or how any, anyone who wants to reach out uh, can find out some more. Yep. As, as mentioned, we're recently um, acquired by MasterCard. So obviously we work through the MasterCard channel as well, but we go direct. Um, so we have a team here in, in Singapore um, and anyone who wants to kind of reach out more than happy to, to kind of have a chat as to uh, via LinkedIn um, or anywhere else, essentially, uh, we can send out my email also, but essentially we, we look to interact with the, uh, anyone who would be interested in our services, identify the problem, talk to if we have a solution for that. We really don't want to be talking about a solution that may not fit the needs. It may be a different area. Um, and from there, really look to identify if they need a test or they want to test our data um, and then build a solution into wherever makes sense based on that. Um, so generally, we, we support globally. We have a team, as I mentioned, um, set up here in Singapore. It's been here for about uh, almost two years now, actually. Um, and we are just setting up an office in uh, Sydney in Australia and looking to set up an office in China as well. So having that on the ground, face-to-face -face interactions that allow people to, to really kind of understand what we do and how best we can serve their needs. Great. Well, look, just flip over to the last slide and last opportunity for those but what we'll do is there is that white paper available on Learn Security and uh, the EDM that will come out tomorrow with the on-demand session uh, will have that white paper. So there was a, a white paper associated with this particular session. So Niall Whelan, uh, the Principal Data Scientist for Asia Pacific for ACADA, thank you very much uh, for that session. Very informative and makes us want to go review our systems now and uh, see what we've got. But uh, it really is about the customer experience and otherwise as uh, he's got up on the slide there reach out on LinkedIn uh, if you've got any other follow-up questions for Niall. So look thank you very much uh, ladies and gentlemen and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. As I said this will be available on Learn Security On Demand uh, within probably a couple of hours uh, and then we'll have a follow-up email tomorrow. Thank you very much for joining us. I'll end the session. Thanks Niall. Thanks Chris. Cheers.